Hello and welcome to Designing Your Career as a Regulatory Professional. My name is John McMahon and I manage relationships with RAF's enterprise partners and corporate accounts. The need for competent regulatory workforce from entry level to the executive level is acknowledged around the world and RAPS is the only nonprofit organization 100% committed to understanding and actively supporting those involved with the regula regulation of healthcare and related products. Founded in 1976, RAPS is a community of more than 25,000 professionals from over 60 countries. We're headquartered just outside of Washington, D.C., and we also have offices in Europe and Asia and chapters and affiliates worldwide. Professional development is really important, but it's just not that easy to develop an action plan that actually enhances regulatory performance. The goal of today's webinar is to provide you with ideas on how to build out a plan and roadmap for career success. Our mission is driving regulatory excellence, and we hope this webinar helps you along this path. Before we get started, if you have any questions during the webcast, please enter them in either the chat or questions boxes at the bottom left hand of the screen, and we'll address them at the end of the session. Now, taking you through our webcast will be Chris Hall, RAP's Director of Education and Professional Development. Chris, I'll pass things over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, so first, what I'm going to do is talk about um, allocation of time and how it relates to professional development planning. So this chart that you see here was pulled from the 2014 RAP Scope of Practice and Compensation Survey of the Regulatory Profession. And it reflects how regulatory professionals spend their time which directly relates to the type of information and skills you should be considering for your professional development planning. Now, RAPS conducts our scope of practice survey every two years and has done so since 1990. And the 2014 survey had more than 3,300 regulatory professionals representing 62 countries. So there was a nice um, compilation, a good broad um, consideration in terms of allocation of time and other things. The respondents answered questions about their compensation, job responsibilities, and professional and educational backgrounds. Now, the scope of practice report is helpful for regulatory professionals seeking to benchmark their places among colleagues, those looking to get into the profession, as well as hiring managers and talent management professionals charged with attracting and retaining regulatory expertise. Clearly, to the responsibilities of today's regulatory professionals go well beyond product registration and compliance. The core work of the regulatory professional begins with gathering and analyzing re regulatory information, developing regulatory strategy, and managing the regulatory functions throughout the product life cycle. As seen in the middle of this chart, however, involvement in business-related activities increased for most job levels in comparison to the 2012 study and the amount of time allocated to overall organizational strategy, seen here in the dark blue, increased significantly among specialists, managers, directors, and vice presidents, which I'm sure many of you on the call have experienced. So now what I'd like to do is share a few case studies that uh, illustrate what regulatory professionals such as yourself are facing, and then I'm going to talk about a professional development planning framework that you should hopefully find very helpful. So let's start with Stephen. Stephen is a level one, he's introductory, he's new uh, to, in an organization called PharmaQ, which is a, f a fictional global-based pharmaceutical company, and Stephen is a regulatory affairs specialist. So in this role, Stephen is responsible for the compilation and publishing of a variety of drug product submissions. He contributes to the company's overall publishing strategies to ensure that compliance submissions are delivered according to the U.S. Regulatory Submissions Plan and in accordance with FDA requirements. He also assists in managing registration files and prepares the first draft of all required responses to FDA. And Stephen loves his job because he can see the important contribution that regu regulatory professionals make towards ensuring that drug safety and efficacy <clears throat> is a priority for PharmaQ. His biggest challenge, however, has been acquiring skills and knowledge quickly enough to perform on the job the way he knows he can. And this is only his first year in regulatory, and he's impatient with how long it takes to acquire knowledge and skills by waiting for budget approval to attend in-person sessions that are often held out of state, and I'm sure many of you can relate to that. The demands of his job don't leave much time 
even when he does get permission to attend these in-person in sessions as often as he would like to do. And on top of that, Stephen isn't even sure how to start identifying his personal professional development priorities. And I'm going to take you through a framework that would help uh, Stephen uh, to get started. That's going to be a key piece of what, what I'll take you through. So next we have another case study I'd like to talk about, and we have Carla, who is a regulatory affairs manager also at PharmaQ. Now, Carla is, is primarily responsible for risk-benefit analyses for the company's product portfolio. She also handles monitoring and any required post-marketing surveillance and vigilance activities within the U.S. to ensure the company is compliant with FDA requirements. During her tenure with PharmaQ over the last several years, Carla honed an integrated understanding of regulatory affairs as it applies throughout the product life cycle. She previously served as PharmaQ's Regulatory Affairs Specialist, handling the company's submissions and registration, as Stephen is doing now. In doing so, Carla developed exceptional project management capabilities and was exposed to aspects of PharmaQ's regulatory strategy. She has a heavy workload, and one of the challenges she faces is prioritization of all the tasks that must get done while still finding time to invest in professional growth so she can advance her career as well as those who report to her. She knows that in order to progress in her profession, she must shift from tactical to a more strategic regulatory affairs role. And this was highlighted in that allocation slide where it was kind of like regulatory strategy is becoming more and more important. Her challenge, however, is that she isn't sure what types of skills or knowledge acquisition that I would entail to move to the next level. And then on a personal level, traveling out of town can be difficult for Carla because of family commitments. So Stephen and Carla are facing the same issues that many of you are facing every day that you work, you know, time constraints, money constraints, and many questions about where to begin. And that's what I'd like to talk about next is an actual framework or a development planning process that can help you assess what the, the, the development plan should be. And what you see here on the screen are kind of some high-level ways to kind of capture the information, and it will help you walk through a process. Now this first line here, they're the boxes that you see in green, uh, where it says determine your regulatory professional level and self-assess strengths and weaknesses. This is mostly categorized by work you would do as an individual. Um, and you will share with others, but first it's good to kind of get an assessment of what regulatory professional are you. And this can be aided by a few things. The scope of practice certainly is a good place to start. Many of you, when you're in an organization, your organization has a specific way in which it categorizes regulatory professionals, um, but generally speaking, you have a sense for where you are in, in your um, career. Now, the self-assessed strengths and weaknesses, it's helpful to have a tool to do so, and RAP's scope of practice is very helpful as it shows by specific job level the types of things that those individuals work on throughout their day or throughout the week. RAPS also is in the process of up updating its competency model, which will be very helpful because it will show by level of, of, of employee or professional the skills, knowledge, and competencies that are needed for high-level performance. And I think it is also important, again, to kind of check internally if you're worth, with an organization the types of things that they're looking for at the level in which you're operating. Now, this self-assessment, it's key that it's a constructive, hard look at yourself and kind of owning if you have a strength or a weakness, make sure you're aware that you knowing yourself is extremely important. And a lot of times individuals are actually, it's actually harder for them to talk about their strengths than their weaknesses. So make sure you have a sense for both. And moving on to the second line in discussing the results, that would, that's when you start involving others in the conversation. Certainly your supervisor if you're working, uh, a mentor if you're, if you're lucky enough to have a mentor, uh, or even other peers in your network, colleagues, um, that can really help you as they might have a different sense for your skill, knowledge, or ability. Uh, they'll help you see some blind spots that you may not have seen by yourself, both in terms of weaknesses and strengths. You know, they may, you may be perceived as being a strong communicator, you never really knew that. So it, it really is important to talk to others about that. Next you have, you don't want to forget about your individual learning style. And this is extremely important when it comes to uh, retention of any information that you might learn, be it a skill, be it just information that you're taking in how to do something. Uh, sometimes people are better when they see something as opposed to listening to something or, or doing something. So there's any number of ways in which you can learn. Just be aware of what your preferred style is. 
And there's another very real variable, and that's the amount of available time. And that's why it's going to be important for you to be talking with your supervisor or others that are going to be very interested in what your workload is. And that, that kind of dovetails into the next line, which is actually creating the plan. Um, and it needs to be a realistic plan, and preferably in writing, um, which I know it can be extra work, but when you have it in writing, it raises a level of commitment, and it makes it easier to follow as well. Now, one thing that's important to do is have the development objectives be SMART. And SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Time-bound. And all of these are of equal importance when you're doing any sort of plan, really. You've probably seen this in, in project management, but it also applies to professional development because it can assess your progress along the way. You can reconfigure if need be. And in some instances, if you've got a plan like this, it could also justify expense um, if your employer would, would require something like that. But simply writing it down and, and monitoring your progression against that is extremely helpful for you because you get a sense of accomplishment and some wins along the way. Uh, next thing you're going to want to do is, as you've identified gaps and, and compared it to kind of the skills and, and knowledge that you need, is to identify some, some potential resources. So in the case of Stephen, who was newer to regulatory, something like regulatory focus that RAPS offers, it's, it's very broad, it's, it's, a, it's a publication, it's actually it's delivered every day, um, got, has good regulatory intelligence, things that are going on in the environment, very helpful. Or maybe something like RAPS' Fundamental of U.S. Regulatory Affairs, um, which is, again, is a very comprehensive text that we offer as well as a Regulatory Affairs Pharmaceutical Certificate Program. And this is also helpful. It's an online certificate program. And if Stephen is better in that he wants to do things on his own time and he's better and a learner by, by viewing something, this might fit him better. It also gives a good, good uh, mix of core uh, courses to uh, somebody who's in pharmaceuticals as well as the opportunity to have some electives. Now, on Carla's side, she's going to be kind of maybe a little bit higher level when it comes to her resources. You know, more uh, detailed regulatory intelligence that RAPS offers through regulatory reconnaissance. Uh, and she may even be to the point where she wants to pursue her regulatory affairs certification credential, or the RAC, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, typically, that's when you have at least three to five years of experience um, that you would be considering the RAC. And then there are some of those resources that go along with preparing for the RAC. Carla probably knows very much about um, pharmaceuticals, and so she may need to provide um, some uh, instances or some additional resources on the medical device side. Um, so these are just some examples, and, and John's going to take you in um, over this in a little bit, some additional resources. And I do want to say, I just want to answer a question, uh, what the S in SMART means, and that means be specific about your objectives, not something general, but something that's specific and then you can measure something against it. Oh, and then finishing off this slide, the last two boxes are, are important and sometimes overlooked, and that's being in an environment to support learning transfer and staying engaged. And a good example for this of learning transfer, I'm sure many of you are extremely busy and maybe it's better if you take some time if you have to do something at home, perhaps, and you're going to watch a recording or take an online course, it's probably better to go in a quiet room. I know when I want to learn something, I've got a few daughters. I can't stay as engaged if they're in the other room. So make sure you, you create an environment that will facilitate learning transfer and be realistic about when you're going to be able to do the learning. And that will help you stay engaged as well. This isn't a one-time thing. It's, it's kind of a living document. It's a living process that you'll continually need to go through. Now what you see here, um, these are two example guides, one at the manager level and one at the employer level, and they will be provided to you after this webcast as a template to get you started. You want to make sure that you tailor them to fit your specific organization and the way in which it operates as well as your specific situation, but again, it will be a good template to at least get you started. And what you can see here or what you will see when we send it to you is that the various phases listed here, preparation, you know, holding the discussion and then drafting and implementing the development plan, they mirror very much the slides that I had discussed on the previous page. But at least you'll have this kind of takeaway that will be helpful for you. And now to talk more about specific resources that RAPS offers, I'm going to hand things back over to John. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, in terms of RAPS, Chris uh, touched on a couple of resources that we have. 
We do offer uh, numerous professional development resources that can help with your own professional development plan. We offer RAPS membership, which is either individual or organizational-wide. Um, the organizational-wide membership we call Enterprise Membership, which provides access to everybody within your organization to all of our membership resources. And that includes timely news and information, education and training, networking, and other resources. Uh, the news that we provide, it's global in nature, covers the U.S., all worldwide markets, and it's delivered primarily through our regulatory focus publication, which is all digital online and includes a number of components. Um, regulatory reconnaissance offers daily news and intelligence. Regulatory roundups provide coverage of regulatory news in Asia and Europe. Regulatory trackers provide updates on regulatory legislation. Um, regulatory explainer breaks down regulatory issues into plain terms. For example, the 400-page 21st Century Cures Act that was uh, that, that was released a few months ago, we broke that down into 10 pages and summarized it very succinctly for ease of use. And then we also provide in-depth feature articles. In terms of education and training resources, we provide, RAPS provides self-paced online learning courses, close to 50 of them. We also provide webcasts on a regular basis, textbooks and reference resources. Chris mentioned the Fundamentals of Regulatory Affairs Guides. That's a great resource. Um, for anybody in regulatory. We also have conferences, workshops, and other face-to-face -face programs, uh, as well as an executive development program we offer through the Kellogg School. And we also have business leadership and soft skills training. In terms of the learner community, that's our learning management system. Again, it provides coverage of e-learning courses and certificates that we, we have designed and provide to regulatory professionals, as well as topical bundled programs. And then we also provide uh, on-site training that's tailored to your needs and delivered on-site at a location of your choice. And then we can also blend the two and provide online learning as well as in-person learning, which really is a great combination. And then finally, we have uh, career and networking resources. We provide online career fairs and in-person career fairs and guidance. And also, we have 13 U.S. and 5 non-U.S. chapters, 8 worldwide networks, and also an online regulatory exchange that people can exchange ideas. And then uh, closing out, finally, we have the Regulatory Affairs Certification Exam, which is offered through RAPS and Chris touched on. Um, at this point, that's kind of a summary of, uh, of our various resources. We would love to take questions uh, that you've been able to um, provide throughout the, the website, and we'll be happy to answer them at this time. So John, I'll go ahead and I'll take the first one. Somebody had asked, what's the difference between an associate and specialist? And that's actually a really difficult question for us here at RAPS to answer um, because different organizations define them in different ways. They're, they're, they, in some organizations, they are interchangeable. In others, the specialist um, is a higher level than an associate, and then still others, an associate is higher level than specialist. Generally speaking, it's more, it's those that are earlier in their career and they are doing, they are supporting what the regulatory managers and, and above the regulatory managers, the directors and the vice presidents are doing. So it's more task oriented. Uh, they're still learning about strategy, but the, strat, the strategic piece is more at the, the managerial and director level and the specialist associates, again, generally speaking, um, they will do the, the tasks that are associate, associated with supporting that strategy. Great. In terms of, there's a question about the newsletter and is it only available with membership. Um, we provide some limited information that is available to everybody, but we have a lot of in-depth articles and detailed information um, that is only available to membership through in base, basically individual membership or again through enterprise membership, which is a membership category that we open up corporate-wide to everybody within your organization. Okay. And the, the, the question about the RAC course, um, and uh, John, I'm not sure, you mentioned a course or the credential itself? I mentioned the credential itself. Okay, so there, and that can be confusing. The RAC credential is actually exam-based, um, and the exam, I believe you have, it's 100 multiple-choice questions and you have, I believe, two hours to take the exam. Now, RAPS does offer RAC prep courses, um, and I'm not sure, um, Adam, if that's what you're referring to. 
and those are self-paced, right? So it, it really depends upon how long um, you have to invest. We have a webcast series that's a, two hours a week for six weeks. Uh, some folks, they'll just prepare on their own. And then we have a self-paced uh, um, product that we actually just created. It's a toolbox, and that's got over 25 hours worth of content. So there is no, we don't have a, a course where you would say go somewhere for a week or a weekend and, and take, take a course to get ready. It really does vary upon how we deliver the information. And then there also was a question regarding, oh, somebody wanted to know what the last reference was after regulatory tracker. Um, hopefully I was clear on that, but I, I might have um, not been totally. So in terms of the additional, um, there's a regulatory explainer was, was the key publication that is uh, offered throughout RAPS, and that provides a breakdown of key areas um, that tend to be kind of de very, be very detailed in nature. And the example I gave was of the uh, 21st Century Cures Act. Um, we summarized that entire document in a 10-page summary that made it a lot easier uh, for people to understand that in, in depth. And also, we also publish on a very regular basis in-depth feature articles on regulatory issues across the world. So people interested, we get this question a lot. Um, without RA experience, how do you break into the field? Um, and this is a very common question, and there's a few ways to go about this. A good way to start is assessing your skills that are transferable. Um, go to the work experience that you have, compare it to the work that is done when if you were to look at the, the scope of practice to be able to see here's the type of tasks that are done. You know, skills such as critical thinking, ability to write, ability to communicate, sometimes people look over that kind of thing, um, but those are very much relevant and being able to synthesize large pieces of information, uh, being organized, those are the types of things that are important. But I would also strongly encourage you to, um, RAPS has a great chapter network, um, and you can get that face-to-face -face local opportunity to speak with folks who are in the industry, and also just talk with your network as well um, in terms of getting uh, their thoughts on what entry level would be. And, and, and one final thing to do is, is something called an informational interview, and that can be very helpful, although, albeit it can be difficult to do, but it's not an interview where you're looking for a job, but you just want to talk to somebody who's in the field about what it is that they do. And you're going to get a different reception because you're not looking for a job, you're just looking to learn more about what it is that they do. Um, another question we just got was, is there a magazine? We actually, that's a good question, we actually used to publish a magazine um, but uh, essentially what we've done is turn that into an all-digital publication, which is regulatory focused. So everything that was offered through the magazine is, is available online digitally to, uh, to members. Um, also, there is a question about, um, could you talk about the self-assessment tool available through RAPS? We actually, that's a good question too. We actually are in the process of, of developing a self-assessment tool at RAPS. Um, we're taking things in stages. Uh, Chris had mentioned that we have a framework that is being updated and that will be available to folks soon. And then based on that, we're going to use a lot of the feedback from that in terms of developing this online assessment tool, which should be uh, available for release in, in 2016, uh, probably the first half of the year, first quarter of the year. And we'll have a lot more information on that as it becomes available. The next, there's a few questions about um, average, the RAC exam, average time required to prepare, or when is it recommended? You know, that, that RAC, and, and I, I believe we're, there's different levels in terms of how much experience you have in conjunction with the um, uh, collegiate, if you have a master's, a bachelor's, or, or a doctoral degree. So I do urge you to go to raps.org. I apologize, I don't have the top of my head exactly what those are. But what I will say is that it's designed for folks who have at least three to five years of experience um, because it's not just recall, it's not you just study something and then you take an exam. It's, it's, it's your ability to take a question, analyze it, uh, think about its application, and then apply perhaps the right regulations, but it's more than just learning the regulations. So in terms of how long does it take, it really depends on your background. Um, and how much you already know. You know, typically what we'll see is people start about three to six months out. Um, but again, some people like to cram and some people like to do it over a year. It just really depends on your style. 
And in terms, you know, in terms of eligibility for the RAC, I should review that real quickly too. In terms of sitting for the RAC exam, it requires at least one of the following, which is a bachelor's degree and at least three years of regulatory related experience, or a master's degree and two years of regulatory experience, and a, or a doctoral degree and one year of regulatory experience. Um, and then in terms of, let me see, what was the other question we had here? Oh, somebody, <coughs> excuse me, somebody's asking about the information that are in the slides we presented, um, when will they be available? I will be sending that information out uh, this afternoon or early tomorrow morning at the very latest. So that, that will be a part of an email that goes to all participants of the, the webcast. Okay, we're just looking. We've got time for one more question. And for those of you who have submitted questions and we don't answer here on the actual webcast, we will be sure to follow up with you uh, individually um, to uh, to make sure that we, we get it answered. Um, I think the probably one of the best ones that we'll, we'll look at is, is joining the chapter network. And essentially when you join RAPS, there is a, um, there's a community tab on our website that will show all the various chapters network. Uh, and you don't have to join per se. You can just show up. You can see the various events that they have and you can, you, can, you can register for a specific event. Some of the networking events are no cost. Some of them are extremely minimal cost in $20 or $30. That's the model that we want to take because at a, at a local level, we can appreciate that you're taking your time out of your busy day and you don't necessarily know a lot about wraps or what's going on. So it's very low cost and there's nothing that you have to join per se um, other than registering for a specific event. Um, you know, in terms of also somebody asked a question about what's the best place on the web page to look at all the training options for the RAC exam and the benefit disadvantage of each option. Um, I, I can also put a link in to our page that describes in the email I sent following this, this webcast. I'll include a, a note in there about the best place to, um, to take a look at that. And somebody else asked about what is the membership fee to register. The membership fee is $220 for RAPS for an individual membership and for enterprise membership it's really based upon the revenue over the organization. We have six different categories of membership fees based on the total revenue of your organization. And if you have a particular question you'd like to ask me about that, um, my contact information is at the end of this presentation and you can at any time um, email me uh, or talk to me. Actually. Um, you know, it isn't on this one. I will send that out. You'll be getting an e email from me with all of my contact information, so that's, that's fine. You'll have that right when I send the information out. I think uh, with that, I think uh, this is the time to, to end the webcast. We've answered all your questions. Um, any other feedback you have, again, follow up. Contact me directly. Uh, my contact information will be available via that email as well the slides that we have. Uh, and in terms of uh, the e-learning course that we're offering uh, complimentary to all participants of this, this webcast today, which is Effective Regulatory Communication, I will be providing instructions on accessing that course um, in the email to follow as well. So we hope you enjoy that course. It's a great course to really learn more about communication as a regulatory professional. And with that, thank you very much for participating, and we hope to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you.